Hello YouTube! Today we're going to discuss the gym to fascism pipeline, namely the phenomenon that seems to push lifters towards right-wing ideologies. Something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I finally get to talk about it because, just last week, the Bioneer published a video where he discussed the link between red pill ideologies and fitness, and it inspired me greatly. But to be clear, this is not a response video, because in his segment, he mostly covers the consequences of these ideas on the mental health of young men. And I think he makes some very good points. I actually really liked his video. What I want to do is something a bit different. Instead, I want to discuss why young men seem to be so attracted towards these ideologies in the first place. So in a sense, I'm completing his video. Naturally, because of the title, you understand that this is going to be fairly political which is something I usually don't do. Even if I do videos that are sometimes controversial or a bit extreme, I always make sure I stay neutral. I don't want to position myself politically because I think it's a waste of time and it antagonizes people. It prevents me from sharing my ideas. But today I don't have a choice. I'm going to have to espouse the binary nature of modern politics. So to make sure that I stay as neutral as possible, I'm going to make sure I don't present one side as good and the other as bad. Instead, I want to explain to you guys why modern gym culture ended up developing such strong ties with right-wing ideologies and also why young men, by and large, seem to fall rather easily for that type of mindset, for that type of politics, rather than the other type. So when you hear me talk about the left, for example, understand that I'm really just discussing a broad spectrum of individuals that are characterized by the fact that they tend to advocate for greater social and economical equality, and they typically also favor more progressive ideas. While when I say right or right-wing, I'll mostly be discussing people who advocate for private ownership, for example, and typically favor socially traditional ideas. Now that you know what we're going to talk about and what the spectrum looks like, we can get into it. So you might have noticed, if you spent any amount of time browsing fitness content on Instagram or YouTube, that a large portion of influencers, especially the ones that promote ideas of self-improvement, are either clearly opposed to left-wing ideology or they're openly right-wing. And this is also seen uh, when you peruse gym memes, you know, gym culture produces gym memes, and the majority of them tend to be extremely anti-PC, if not outright offensive, and they sometimes promote fascist or authoritarian ideals. And while this might not be as visible and obvious within YouTube fitness and our sphere, because the majority of content creators that make fitness content appear apolitical at first, you will, I hope, not be surprised to hear that behind closed doors, the vast majority of them are either conservatives or some shade of libertarian, something that I can tell you because I am behind the scenes. I talk to these people via private messages, and even though they do a very good job at making sure that their ideas and their politics don't transpire in their videos because it's not really their place to do that, right? You talk about fitness, don't inject your own politics in it. When it comes to actually discussing things where the audience is not privy of, they tend to be much more liberated, and for the vast majority of them, these people are, as I said, conservative or right-wing. And actually, I have a very easy way for you to tell if your favorite influencer is right-wing or not. It's actually quite simple you have to simply see if they have ever even shared their ideology or politics with you once. Because something we know with progressive influencers and left-wing influencers is that they tend to be extremely keen to tell you how good of a person they are, so they openly share their politics a lot. But with people who are right-wing, because being right-wing is nowadays shunned, at least on social media, unless your entire grift is, of course, being right-wing, then you would be better off shutting your mouth and saying nothing. So, if your favorite influencer never told you about their politics, most likely it's because they are right-wing. Now, the question is, why? Since fitness is an open market, there should be plenty of space for leftist influencer to also start making videos, because I don't see why or how the fact that you are pro-immigration, for example, would prevent you from teaching people how to get big arms. This makes absolutely no sense. And yet, this is something that we do seem to observe. So, 
My first explanation, and what we're going to get into right now, is biology. You might have heard it at some point or the other, men with low testosterone seem to be more likely to be left-wing, while high T males have a tendency to be more right-wing. And this is not just hearsay, it also has been corroborated by a study from 2011 that showed that men who had low testosterone seemed to be more favorable to progressive ideals, and men with high testosterone were more attracted towards conservative values. And it went even further than that. What they did in the study is that they took all of the males that had low testosterone and they gave them a boost. They put them on TRT. And what they saw was a red shift, meaning that a large portion of these males seemed to reject progressive ideals and they became more conservative as their T levels increased. And since lifting is a high test activity, it therefore would be logical that it would appeal preferentially to people who are right-wing because these people also seem to have higher testosterone on average. And of course, this study was immediately taken by the right and by the alt-right because it painted them as masculine, strong, and superior to the left-wing cocks who have low T, who can get it hard, and who therefore, of course, should be ridiculed. The issue is that apparently these very same people never actually took the time to read the study properly because they ignored two key factors. The first one is that the vast majority of the people in the study who are left-leaning didn't change, meaning that you could increase their test as much as you wanted, you could make them run trend, they would still be left-leaning. The only people who changed their mind were people who never really had opinions to start with. They were soft, they were in between conservative and liberal, so when you slightly improved their T-levels, they just shifted, but it wasn't a major shift. And then there's another thing that's very interesting, and that is the fact that this study had a very small pool of test subjects. So even though it might have been true for the people who are tested, it wasn't for all of them, and it's not enough to then say that this actually applies to the entirety of the population. So the only thing really that this study tells us is that our hormones do indeed seem to have an influence on the way we interact with the world, which I don't think is a surprise to anyone, so that also includes our politics. Low testosterone, for example, is often linked with a heightened empathy, meaning that someone who feels for others is very likely to be pro-immigration, to be pro-migrants, and so they're going to na naturally gravitate towards political parties that are going to have the same values. That is logical. And in the same vein, if you have high T, it's usually linked with more selfishness, risk-taking behaviors, and also a decreased sensitivity to stress and anxiety. So this might push you towards political parties that also align with these values, and it's also logically going to push you towards certain sports. For example, if you go to a boxing club, you're going to meet a lot of people who are going to be right-wing. Why? Because these gyms are going to be filled with people who are super aggressive and who also have a high tolerance for stress, anxiety, and pain. Whereas, if you're someone who's extremely sensitive and who doesn't like to hurt people, you're not going to take up boxing. You're not going to take up a sport where you inflict suffering onto another person for fun. It's simply not going to appeal to you. So, this bias, this testosterone bias, is explained best by the fact that, yes, you're going to follow the natural inclination of your biology. So your local MMA or rugby club is likely filled with people who are going to be right-wing. And anyone who has stepped foot in these environments will tell you that. And if you were to take these men and to test them, you would also likely find out that they have higher testosterone levels than average. So from there, it could be extremely easy and tempting to conclude that it's not actually lifting culture that turns young men right-wing. Rather, it is their natural inclination towards right-wing ideologies that push them towards a pastime that has the exact same value that they already embrace, namely a culture of strength and a culture of selfishness, where if you are strong and if you put in the work, you are going to be rewarded, and if you suck, if you're not willing to suffer, then you're not going to go anywhere. So the obsession with the gym just becomes a symptom of fascist tendencies, and I agree with that to some extent, but we can't stop the explanation here. 
We can't reduce human experience and behavior to just us being bags of hormones. You know, levels of T, levels of estrogen have an impact, for sure, we just proved that, but there's something beyond it because it is this biology that then leads to a culture, and it's the culture that leads to the propagation of said culture. So in order to not fall into the essentialist bias of thinking that you are born the way you're born and then nothing else matters after that, we also have to take a look at the fact that we are molded by our environment and the culture that surrounds us. And this leads me to my second explanation. Since lifting is a traditionally masculine endeavor and pursuit, it is also likely that the men who gravitate towards gym culture will also be stereotypically masculine. And since they're going to congregate together, they're going to create a culture where the dominant values will be masculine values, which is what is known as in-group values. And these also seem to align preferentially with right-wing values because these are also associated with selfishness and a pull yourself by the bootstraps mentality that is extremely common amongst fitness influencers. But it doesn't stop there. Once the identity of the in-group is settled, in order to cement it, it needs an out-group, meaning something that can work as an ideological opponent with different views and different values. And that group, at least on the internet, seems to be the left. So on one side, you have the hyper-masculine high-T chads who also happen to be right-wing, and on the other hand, you have your leftist cocks, you have your low-T fags, and other types of beta males, which are all charming nicknames that were given to them by the right in order to paint them as bad. This is essentially what every group does. We are good, and the opponent, the opposition, is bad. It's not enough to paint the left as bad. They are inherently bad, their essence is bad. So the reason why they are bad is pathological, and this connects back to what I said about testosterone. Why does the right focus so much and obsess so much over testosterone? It's because it allows, to, it allows them to paint themselves as healthy, as normal and natural men, and they can paint the other side, the, again, the beta males, the leftist cocks, as not being real men because their T is so low that they are essentially women. And this is why you see the divide in the political spectrum where left-wing left ideology is associated with feminine energy and right-wing ideology being associated with masculinity. So once that is established, it's not so surprising to see that there won't be many left-wing lifters or influencers on this platform. Why would you want to join a culture and a group that has, that has decided to designate you as the enemy and even worse, paints you as some sort of anomaly of nature? No one is going to want to do that. So it isn't just that lifting and physical culture in general is more appealing to people who are right-wing, but also that this ideology has made its nest within gym culture, which now acts as a repellent for anyone who might not relate to this ideology. And as I said, the fact that concepts such as strength or even masculinity itself are now by and large owned by the right wing seems to corroborate that point. Because when you look at influencers who promote masculinity, for example, they're all right wing. If you look at the other side of the spectrum, the left wing influencers tend to promote ideas that attempt to deconstruct masculinity or paint it as bad or toxic. And this is where we get into that other side of the discussion, because even though the right has put in a lot of work to own gym culture, it would be unfair to claim that it's only their work and their responsibility. The left is also partly responsible for that state of affair because they traditionally tend to reject concepts that align with physicality, and so they have a very tough time trying to get a claim on gym culture and on lifting in particular, because they seem to despise the very essence of the practice. So if the right is the party of personal responsibility, sometimes to a fault, then the left is the exact opposite. On one hand, you have people who are like bootcamp instructors who are going to scream at you that if you want it hard enough, you'll get it, even though that's not always true. On the other side, you'll have hippies who will tell you that it's not your fault if you fell and that trying hard is not going to make any difference, which links back to what we said earlier about perceived level of testosterone, because 
if you have increased empathy, it also means that you're very unlikely to tell people when something isn't right, when something is their fault, when they need to fix their shit. And what is fitness if not fixing your shit? You're supposed to tell people to improve. But if you refuse to point to their faults, they'll never improve because the only way to improve is to correct the person that you are. And here we see another important shift I have to describe. And that is the shift between an internal locus of control and an external one. So people who have an internal locus of control believe that everything is their fault, everything is their responsibility. If something happens, it's because of them. People who have an external locus of control believe that things happen to them. So their responsibility is outsourced. These are typically people who are going to blame the world, blame society and blame the system for their shortcomings. And if we are to assign one to each side of the spectrum, I think it's fair to say that the right tends to hyper-focus on internal locus of control to the point that sometimes, again, it's ridiculous. Or they'll tell you, well, if you're homeless, you deserve it, even though something could have happened to you. We don't control every circumstance in our lives. But the left also falls for that type of caricatural approach to, to life and existence where they focus so much on the external locus of control that they're very likely to tell you that the individual is completely helpless in the face of much greater powers. And so blaming anyone for their circumstances or their lot in life is always wrong and you should never do it because you don't know what they had to go through, which naturally also ignores patterns where if someone fucks up for 10 years, it's not just fate. It's not just something out to get them. The one thing that is present in all of these scenarios is them in, and their behavior. So blaming the behavior is also sound and sane at some point, especially if you want to help that person improve. And this is why the left struggles so much when it comes to fitness and self-improvement. If you have that type of mindset I just described, you can't preach self-improvement at the same time. It's completely antithetical, which explains why fitness icons and people who are highly influential and motivate people a ton tend to be the ones who insist on an internal locus of control. So a guy that I have on my list here is David Goggins. What is David Goggins if not the, the epitome, if not the embodiment of internal locus of control? The guy had a shit life, he was obese, and he got himself out of that. He became a, a super uh, fit soldier, and now he's widely regarded as a success. And when you ask him, hey, how did you do it? He'll tell you, well, I kicked myself in the butt, and I just got it done. That's it, that's his mentality. Get it fucking done. Now, is he right? Is it possible for everyone to learn this power? Of course not. He's David fucking Goggins. The vast majority of people will never be even close to his level of willpower. But what matters is not whether or not he's correct. What matters is, is he influential? Do people want to follow him? And to that, the answer is yes. Because when people look for fitness advice, what they want is someone that tells them they have to put in the work and everything they want will be accomplished. As long as you put in the work, you can achieve anything. That is the American dream. And this is the stuff that young men want to hear. Now contrast this with this quote by Foucault, who is a famous French philosopher regarding exercise. Exercise is the technique by which one imposes on the body tasks that are both repetitive and different, but always graduated. By bending behavior towards a terminal state, exercise makes possible a perpetual characterization of the individual. So essentially, Foucault's understanding of physical culture is one based on power. To him, lifting is tyranny imposed over the self by the self, and to train the body is only really a mean to accumulate power, power that can then be used either to judge others that you are going to deem as inferior or worse, oppress them entirely by using your might to place them under your foot. This is a very nuanced, very intellectual approach to fitness, one that takes into account historical and cultural context so that it can then be utilized to discuss power imbalances within society, which can then eventually lead to a critique of capitalism, for example, which is great, but the problem is that no one wants to hear that. No young man is going to read what I just told you and think, damn, it makes me want to do push-ups. No, because it's not the goal. 
But you see, the vicious part of this side of the political spectrum and left-wing philosophy, quote-unquote, is that war is going to completely fly over the head of a lot of young men who are going to align much more with David Goggins, it's also going to teach the wrong lesson to people who are going to be very receptive to that message. And these people tend to be left-wing. Their nature aligns them with left-wing ideology. And what they will understand from what I just told you is that self-improvement is authoritarian. It's painful. And so, because it is painful and because it is linked with discipline, which discipline is a form of torture, again, over the self, it is linked with authoritarianism, and as we all know, anything authoritarian is bad, even if it is authority of the self over the self. So, any practice that requires discipline is going to be dismissed as bad. And then you look at the fact that lifting is indeed the pursuit of power. And as Foucault said, what is power but, it, but something that you use to oppress people? Well, then it's a second strike against lifting because now lifting is authoritarian and something that you do to accumulate power. So essentially, in the head of left-leaning people, the practice of moving weights from point A to point B, of getting bigger and getting stronger, becomes just something that fascists do. And the fact that their ideological enemy has espoused lifting as their thing, as something that they deem very important, is only going to confold them in that idea. So now they have a way to rationalize why they don't like lifting. And also they have proved that people who do lift are bad people in their book. So the chance of them then being able to influence gym culture in a relevant way is zero. But I think for the few of you who have actually read Foucault, that you understand what the problem is. Because what I just presented to you was a caricature. It was a complete one-dimensional understanding of physicality. Because Foucault himself also said that power should not only be seen as a repressive force, but also a productive one. The problem is that left-leaning people are unlikely to understand this nuance, and so, this leads to a widespread detestation for physical fitness. Something that I've noticed because it might surprise you to know that I follow a lot of Marxist influencers, of people who produce left-leaning content, because I've always believed that it is important to listen to people who disagree with you. There's no point for me to listen to, with, to people who are going to just repeat what I already know or believe, because it's going to create an echo chamber. I want to be challenged, even if it's sometimes painful, it's something that I think helps me grow a ton. And so I have noticed that many people nowadays use left-wing ideology and philosophy to justify their own hatred for lifting, something that in my eyes is simply an excuse to stay weak. I think that these are people who are not very fit, who don't really like to exert effort, and if they were challenged to exist outside of their comfort zone, maybe they would embrace lifting. But because they're able to claim the moral high ground by painting themselves in opposition with the right wing, which loves to lift, it serves as a justification to reject something that is a good thing entirely. And I'm not saying that the left is the sole culprit in this. The right does the exact thing. So the right has a tendency, for example, to demonize values that are positive values like empathy or compassion because they see them as weakness, likewise, which then allows them to behave like complete sociopathic assholes and justifying that by saying, well, because the other camp is rejecting that and because they're bad, then whatever they reject, in this case, callousness, must be good. And this very callousness is a common critique that non-lifters have for people within our circle. Namely the fact that we pretend, or actually we see ourselves as morally superior because we lift weights, because we're fit, and we then use that as an excuse to shame people who don't lift and to act like assholes towards them because we perceive them as inferior to us. And that is a natural continuation to what I was saying earlier with the difference in locus of control. Because if you have an internal locus of control, you're going to have a tendency to look down on those who lack that quality. Because in your view, these people are simply lazy. They're mediocre on purpose. 
you have the ability to bend your will and to force yourself to do certain things, hard things, to become better, but these people don't have it. The issue is that you don't see it that way. You think they have it and they just refuse to use it. And on the other hand, people who lack that internal locus of control are going to see people who treat them in that fashion as elitists and cruel. Because in their view, they can't do what you do. They can't just wish it or will it. They lack that ability entirely and so they are being blamed for something that they perceive as having no control over. I'm sure that if you're fit, you've had that discussion with someone who is not fit or fat. And it's like talking to a rock when you say, well, just eat less, just exercise. And the person looks at you like, you think I haven't tried that? I've tried, I just can't fucking make it. And this is an issue of communication. You're talking past each other because you're coming from completely different perspectives. I actually read a very interesting study about depression that stated that people with severe depression who lived under the same roof as someone, as someone who has an internal locus of control tended to see worsening symptoms and their depression tended to get much, much worse faster because they were constantly being shamed and blamed for not being able to just tough it out or pull themselves out of, out of the depression by someone who was completely incapable of understanding that it's not that easy. And this is something that Bioneer actually mentioned in his video. The fact that, yes, it is entirely idiotic to believe that just because you managed to get fit off of willpower alone, then everyone can. Because that's not true. There are people who simply lack the ability to do that. They lack the ability to apply themselves. The one point where I disagree with him, however, is the fact that you won't stop people who have a superior will from thinking themselves above those who have a weak will. I think it's only natural to think that if you can literally shape reality with your imagination and simply because you've desired it, you're going to look at people who can do that and think, okay, well, it's the equivalent of me being able to do magic and, not be, and you not being able to do magic. You're a muggle. I'm a fucking sorcerer. So naturally, I'm above you in the order of things. And this is a very poisonous and toxic mindset to have, but it's one that is literally never going to go away. And it goes way, way beyond fitness. And likewise, I think that you will never stop men who think that their way of life is superior from trying to propagate it as much as possible. Because if you think you're living life the right way, you're going to try and impose that onto others. Which, by the way, is how societies are formed. This is how you create a group of individuals that all follow the same values. You set a list of standards and of desirable traits that people must possess for society to thrive. And then these standards and values must be upheld at all costs because it allows for the continuation of the status quo, which in return benefits the people that set up society. So naturally, the people that cannot live up to these standards are going to be shamed and are going to be rejected because they're literally killing society. They're making it so that the system doesn't work. And this is not the discussion at hand today, but it's something that is very important to keep in mind. Because here I'm not telling you that one system is better than the other. That's not the point. What I'm telling you is that these standards exist, regardless of society. Our, common, our current society has standards. The only difference is, are they very demanding? Do they challenge people? If they are, what ends up happening is that the people who will be able to clear the standards will be excellent. So society will preferentially create excellent people. But not just excellent people, it would be too easy it's also going to create a lot of people who cannot live up to that system and they'll fail. And these people are going to struggle. These people will have poor mental health. They're going to have no self-worth because society itself as a system tells them that they fucking suck. The other option is to lower the standards. So if you lower the standards, what you end up seeing is that people have a much higher chance of succeeding in society. So there's a higher success rate. But because you demand less of them, you also produce much more mediocrity because people don't have to challenge themselves as much to be able to meet your standards. The question that follows is, which system is the best? Again, not my place to answer it today. I think you already know my answer. But what I wanted to explain to you with these examples is the fact that what I just described is essentially a right-wing mindset 
which some might describe as an aristocratic mindset, and a left-wing mindset, which is much more democratic. And what we see with modern fitness is the prior version. It is an elitist, aristocratic mindset where if you make it, you're good. And if you don't make it, fuck you. We're not going to lower the standards for you. And this is why elitism as a practice is extremely present within fitness spheres. Since the majority of influencers are right-wing or have right-wing proclivities, they're all going to promote the same pull yourself by the bootstraps mentality, which is really just survival of the fittest. They don't care about the people who are left on the side of the road. These people don't matter. These people are weaklings. And this is also why these very same influencers are very likely to be assholes about it. Because if you can't meet my standards, then why should I be nice to you? You don't deserve that. If anything, these people will tell themselves that by not being nice to people, it's going to motivate them even more to meet these standards. But that is also completely disregarding the internal and external locus of control. And also something very important and a proverb, a Russian proverb I want to share with you. The proverb goes as follows. The same water that softens the potato hardens the egg. What does it mean? It means that if you put two individuals in the same set of circumstances, one will thrive, the other will suffer. Because we don't respond the same to stimulus, we don't respond the same to environments. I'm the type of person that thrives off of negativity. I love challenges. I love to be told you can't do it. It makes me want to do it. But I've known people, personally, who thrive off of positive affirmation and reinforcement. You need to tell these people they're doing good, that you're proud of them, that they're getting somewhere. Because if you don't do that, if you're rough towards them, they're going to just give up. They will not respond positively to abuse. But when you look at the common traits that all of these right-wing influencers ha have, it's that. It's that they ignore that, they push away compassion as weakness, and they say, okay, Marche ou crève, walk or die, which only really has one outcome, that the people who already align with these values and who already have what it takes to make it will simply follow. They're going to become more radicalized. They're going to fall more and more into this ideology and the rest will be filtered out. And when these people get filtered out, what do they do? Well, they go see the opposite camp. They go see people who are going to be nice and welcome them with open arm. And these people tend to be left wings. Left wing influencers nowadays have a monopoly on empathy. The right has a monopoly on strength and fitness, but kindness, compassion, that those are left wing traits. And this creates two poles. And these poles drift away from one another more and more and more because they become hyper-specialized in their specific traits. So they reject more and more what the other becomes. But the issue is that, and I'm sure you've noticed it, they become caricatures of themselves. Because now they've become so extreme that the values they defend have become absurd. So if we take, for example, two influential figures of each side of the spectrum, on one hand, you have Andrew Tate, and on the other, you have Vosch. So on one hand, you have an hyper-masculine Neanderthal who overdoses on red pills. And on the other, you have a flabby untermensch with a blob body that looks like he can't even curl the pink dumbbells. And I'm not taking a side here. I think that both of them are equally ridiculous. It's just to tell you that between the two, it really isn't surprising that young men would gravitate towards Andrew Tate and not Vosh. Because he is the guy who's going to tell you that masculinity is under attack and you have to toughen up. And these are the things that young men want to hear. Always remember this. Between a weak horse and a strong horse, men will forever gravitate towards the strong horse. For those of you in the know, yes, that is an Osama Bin Laden quote, because apparently this video is not controversial enough. But what the quote means is very simple. People, and men in particular, are attracted to strength. So if an ideology promotes strength as one of its values, men will disregard the rest, even if the rest is horrible, because it's the only thing they care about. It doesn't make it good. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying that this is a fact. So telling young men to just stop following these ideologies because they're bad or toxic or they disenfranchise women or minorities won't matter because they don't care about things like this. 
And on top of that, it doesn't address the reason why they were attracted to them in the first place. And you can name that reason whatever you want. You can say it's an attack on masculinity or whatever. The only thing that matters is that there is something happening. And that's something I think is a level of instability. Men don't quite know where they stand. We don't really know what our role is supposed to be. And we're trying really hard to find it. So when people come out and they tell us, hey, your role is this, even if this is not true, we'll espouse it because at least it's a direction to follow. I know that many people push away against that idea, claiming that all of this is just a knee-jerk reaction by men who are losing their privilege. It's possible, but the one thing that I want to say is that it really doesn't matter. Even if the disenfranchisement of men is a complete fabrication, it doesn't change the fact that their suffering is real and that they perceive that misery as real. So dismissing it only really serves to further isolate men. The only thing you'll accomplish by doing that is to alienate young men. And this is something that Jordan Peterson has perfectly understood. There is a first amongst young men and no one quite knows what they're thirsty for. What we know is that they want to drink. So if you offer them something to quench their thirst with, you're going to be very famous and very influential. Now, it can be argued that whatever Jordan Peterson or any of these influencers is actually making these men drink is not going to do them any good. You can argue that. You can say that they're feeding them poison. But understand that between people who make them drink poison and people who tell them that their thirst isn't real, they're always going to favor the first type. Because the first type actually looks at their problems and accept that, yes, they are problems. So for anyone who laments the right-wing dominion over fitness, the answer is therefore, what alternative do you propose? What do you offer? You can't just point out at right-wing influencers or ideologies and say, oh, this is bad. That's not enough. In order to replace a value, you have to come up with a more favorable value. And the same goes for masculinity, by the way. I perfectly agree that masculinity can be improved, but you will never get men on board with that idea if the only thing you do is tear down. You also have at some point to build. So here are a few propositions that I have for liberal, Marxist, or otherwise progressive-minded individuals who want to reconquer the gym and fitness culture in general. First, do away with the hatred for physical culture. Not just because it's going to allow you to appeal to people who like the idea of the gym and lifting weights, but also because the very notion of Marxist theory relies on strength. It relies on the pursuit of power. If you really want the communist paradise and utopia to take root in reality at some point, you need to get strong because I think you have realized at this point that capitalism isn't just going to go away and it's also never going to die. As we're seeing with the current cost of living crisis, it's simply going to devolve into worse and worse versions of itself in which the only people who struggle are those who cannot make hands meet. The people at the top are going to do just fine. So since the post-capitalism utopia isn't just going to materialize out of thin air, this means that the only way forward for your ideology is revolution. And as Lenin used to say, you cannot fight a revolution in white gloves. Meaning that you're not overthrowing anything if you can't at least deadlift double your body weight. That is bare minimum requirement. And keep in mind that uh, communist countries such as Soviet Russia or China put an extreme emphasis on physical development. To the point that Mao was quoted to say that in primary school, particular attention should be paid to the development of the body. Progress in knowledge and moral training are of secondary importance. And I'm only being partly sarcastic here, but I actually do believe that people who follow left-wing ideologies would also benefit from lifting weights and from the pursuit of power and strength. If you firmly believe in your heart that this system is the best for humanity as a whole, then not only do you have to get your body stronger and bigger, but you also have to make sure that your ideology is going to be attractive to young men. And the good thing is that you don't have to look very far because this modern hatred for physicality is that modern. Old school Marxists 
tended to really focus on the development of power and a lot of that was via physical fitness. So I advise doing away with all this modern leftist sensitivity and going back to a good old Stakhanovist mindset. I think that this would be a much better way to make your movement palatable to young men. Because think about it this way. The reason why the vast majority of gay people are left-leaning isn't just because their natural inclinations push them towards these political parties, but it's also because they get to freely express themselves if they follow these ideologies. So, naturally, they're very unlikely to be conservative because a conservative government is going to directly impeach their ability to be themselves and to live their life the way they intended. And the same goes for young men. Young men like strength. Young men want to lift shit. They think it's cool. So they become right-wing because it's the system that best aligns with who they are and what they want to be. That doesn't shame them for pursuing strength, for trying to be manly men. But this also means that if someone were to come out and preach Marxism to them, while at the same time having massive biceps and a big deadlift and squat, I guarantee you that this guy would be extremely popular with young lifters. And I understand that this is a tall task, because the majority of modern leftist commentators have the muscle mass of yogurt, which naturally explains why they hate traditional masculinity. It's because they failed to live up to its standards, so instead of accepting that it's them who suck, they try to cancel the entire thing entirely. But understand that there is a majority of young men who think that muscle and strength are super cool, and you will never convince them otherwise. So unless you can align with some of the values that they deem cool, you'll never be able to influence their behavior and push them towards paths that you believe are healthier for humanity as a whole. Because I guarantee you that it is possible to make young men embrace tolerance and embrace empathy as long as you make it fit within the framework. And to do that, I think that the most important part of the work will have to be a focus on aesthetics. Because let's be clear, the vast majority of people who call themselves communists online are people who never read a line of Marxist theory. And likewise, the vast majority of people who call themselves authoritarian or fascist online couldn't tell you what NSDAP stands for. I can because I took German. It's Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. But um, I say this not to tell you that these people are phonies, they are phonies, but rather to explain to you that the reason why people align with ideologies is first and foremost because of the way it makes them feel and also because of how it makes them look. If it makes them feel good about themselves because it aligns with their values, if it makes them feel, uh, look cool in the eyes of others, then they're very likely to follow these ideologies. And this is why I say that gym culture isn't really fascist. Rather, it follows the aesthetics of fascism, which includes traits that we discussed previously, such as elitism. Because if you want a group that is going to make you feel good about yourself, you also want a group that isn't going to be afraid of saying that they're the best and that the rest sucks, which explains why chauvinism is so popular amongst young men. But it's not just on that side of the spectrum. I could tell you an example that doesn't align with typical right-wing or at least Western right-wing values, and that is Islam. Why do you think Islam is so popular? Why do you think so many Western white men convert to Islam? It's very simple. It's because Islam isn't afraid of claiming that they're the best. It's unapologetic in its approach. Muslims will tell you that there is one God, that God is Allah, he's unique, he's all-powerful. That is strength. That is the dichotomy between weak horse and strong horse. In the same vein, why do you think Christianity is dying amongst the youth? Why do you think it's dying in Europe? It is because of that. It's because Christianity has rejected its core values, refuses to be elitist, and when you refuse to be elitist and say, hey, we're the best, young men are going to go knock on the door of the person who says they're the best 
and that door is the door of the mosque. So if on one hand you have strong, capable right-wing fascists, and on the other hand you have soft, gooey left-wing idealists, young men, without even thinking twice, will pick the right wing. But it also aligns with an inclination of youth that I think is very interesting, and that is the fact that young people like to go against the culture of their parents. They like to be rebels. And you see that with uh, the memes that these kids produce. Because gym memes, lifting memes, tend to be, as I said, extremely offensive. But it's not because the people who like these memes actually believe in the offensive message. The only thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to be edgy. And this corroborates with the fact that the demographic that is the most extreme online and tends to espouse the most extreme ideology, both fascism and Marxism, communism, tend to be young adults. Like most people I know in my life at my age, none of them espouse that shit. People are like, like center left or center right, but are extremely moderate. Teenagers, young adults, on the other hand, tend to gravitate towards edgy ideologies because it's a natural part of your development. You don't want to be like your parents. You don't want to do what society tells you to do. And guess who taps beautifully into that? The right wing. You know who doesn't do that? The left wing. Because PC culture is not appealing to young men. And you know, I I'm not stupid. I know that everything that I just told you, a lot of people who are left wing understand that. But the issue is that all the traits that I just promoted, telling them that it would help them in the fight for gym culture and the spirit of young men, they will reject because they deem them bad. So they won't follow my advice. But in a way, that's also a smart business move because if you ally with like the LGBT movement, for example, you're going to have to also stand against an heteronormative patriarchal system because this is the root of all evil for these people. So you can't at the same time also try to like lure people in who like the values that that type of system promotes. And these people tend to be young men. So there is of course a choice to make. The left has made its choice and the right took over that untapped potential. Which is why I think that complaining about fitness being too right wing is a bit silly. It's in the state it's in, not just because the right has monopoly, but because the left allowed the, allowed the right to have monopoly. They don't want to find a compromise. And to be fair, I'm not saying that the right is interested in that either. As I said, the two are entirely polarized. And one look at the number of bad faith actors who just overdose their audience on red pills in order to profit their own business models is the proof of that. I'm not deluded to that reality. I know for a fact that the vast majority of right-wing influencers are not in it to help young men, which is personally something that I'm attempting to do. And you know, I'm not perfect. You, I'm a human just like you. I have my values and I have things that I believe are right and things that I believe are wrong. And I certainly do align with a lot of right-wing values. For example, I am perfectly fine with elitism. I think that it is good to say that certain ways of life are superior and healthy for humans and others are bad and should be shunned. For example, being fat, being out of shape, smoking, doing drugs, all of these are bad. People should not be doing these things. The question after this is how do we get people to actually follow our advice? And this is where I also believe that things like compassion, Things like empathy are also worthy traits to develop because they allow you to connect with people, to understand where they're coming from, and to allow them to overcome these shortcomings to become the best version of themselves. And I hope this is something that is transparent in my content, meaning that my goal has never been to ostracize people or to make people feel not welcome. I've always said it. If you lift weights and you want to improve, you're my brother or you're my sister. I do not care where you're coming from. This is all that matters to me. But I will also always insist on strength because to me, being kind without being strong is impossible. It's not true kindness you're demonstrating, it's weakness, it's a form of social pressure you're feeling. You are obligated to act a certain way because you don't have a choice. And when there is no agency, there is no virtue. But at the same time, I also believe that being strong without being kind is useless because strength should be used to help the weak, help the innocent, and motivate these people to become strong so that in their turn, they can help others. They can be of use to others. And I think that this 
is the message, the fitness message that has the highest chance to resonate with the audience. Whether they're right wing or left wing, whether they're low T or high T, it doesn't matter. I think we can all agree on that. And this is what I'm going to end this video on. So it was much longer than I expected as always, but I hope you had a good time. If you want to support my work, if you like that type of philosophical expose or discussions about society, you can always support the channel. It's the first link in the description. It's my coffee page. $3 a month is already the end of the word. And I thank every single person who has supported me this far. As always, the comments are wide open. You can discuss as much as possible. I never delete comments or moderate my page. Just keep in mind that there are bots and if you become a bit too extreme, your comment will be shadow banned. So please be careful. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.